Andy, who are you? Who am I? Uh, <laughs> I'm Andy. I've been working for Dynatris for almost nine years now. Uh, before that, I did nine years with a company called Segway Software, which later became Borland. So I did nine years of load testing, broke a lot of apps, and then I followed my former colleague and CTO, Bernd Reifenator, to Dynatrace because he did no longer wanted to break apps, but actually figure out why apps break. That's why I built Dynatrace, uh, a monitoring solution that can monitor what's actually going on within an application without having too much load, but giving actually actionable details back to the engineers, to the load testers, and saying, hey, this is why the application breaks. In the last nine years, I have been in a, let's say, tech evangelist role. I'm reporting still to the CTO and my team. We're trying to figure out what do we need to do as Dynatrace to stay relevant and market leaders. So which trends are coming along, which technologies are coming along, what do we need to support, in which ways monitoring evolving. And the latest thing that I've been doing is a lot around DevOps, around continuous integration, uh, helping helping our customers and I think global industry with educating them through different channels on on how APM, even though I think the market has to be redefined, should no longer be called just APM. It's not just about monitoring and applications. It's end user monitoring comes with it and continuous monitoring. Um, so how we can support these companies that go through that transformation or also new companies, new startups. My name is Martone. I have been doing software testing, specializing in performance for nearly 25 years. Oh my God, it's been 25 years. Um, and uh, I've worked for different companies over the years. I used to work for a little itty bitty load testing company called Merck Interactive way back when in the 90s. When load testing was just fun, you know, it was just fun. We used to, then it got all important, serious, and people started building websites, and things got formal, and we had things like getting amazing centers of excellence. Now we have performance validation and performance engineering. That too much for me. So I went to work at Microsoft um, uh, in the early 2000s, I think 2001. We met probably mm -hmm. 2002, 2003. Uh, and I worked with uh, Microsoft, helping Segway and other partners build integrations. Uh, for performance testing tools, monitoring.net, uh, optimizing.net applications, uh, and spent six years uh, working at Microsoft, then went and went back to work with uh, LoadRunner, actually, as the HP uh, LoadRunner product manager, um, and moved down to California, which is a little crazy, uh, if you've ever visited uh, Palo Alto or Menlo Park or some of these places that are a little nuts. Uh, and then uh, after putting uh, putting some major releases out for LoadRunner, decided uh, to move back to Philadelphia and become an independent uh, performance consultant. Uh, and I've been doing that for four years, working primarily with uh, a company I could say now is PayPal, uh, PayPal Credit down in Baltimore, and recently went full-time with them. Uh, and so I'm continuing through their DevOps transformation, uh, doing a lot of the same kinds of things that uh, Dynatrace uh, and has been working on for years at Dynatrace. And we're, we're manifesting it uh, at, at paper credit, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm Steve Button, um, long timer at uh, Planet. I've been here since September. Um, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love Brisbane. It's a wonderful, wonderful city. Um, I came from Southern California, originally English. Um, so, California, for the last 16 years, I ran a uh, IBM uh, business partner. Cool. Um, uh, specializing in enterprise transformation, systems integration. Um, with the last few years, um, trying to take these uh, monolithic systems of record uh, very rapidly into uh, system engagement. Um, so a great deal of integration using, obviously, IBM tools, um, but it wasn't really enough for us. But we've adopted, um, in this transformation process, it was really important that we, we started to adopt and learn more about DevOps uh, techniques across the life cycle, trying to help our customers in every area. So I'm not a, I'm not a testing person. Um, my background prior to establishing the, the, the company um, in uh, Southern California, where I'm from, although I am English, um, 25 years in SoCal, it makes it kind of crazy anyway. Um, as an yeah, international system director, 16 countries for uh, Mattel Toys, um, transforming uh, manufacturing and distribution systems to standardize uh, their uh, primary distribution uh, channels. And um, then I had uh, led an M&A, um, Consolidation for IT uh, in the Santa Fe Pacific, South mm. Santa Fe and Southern Pacific merger. So it's been a been an interesting ride. Um, Why well, my planet? Uh, they really are global leaders. Um, I've, I've 
don't think I've ever met a company or been, been part of a company that is so innovative in their approach to testing um, and how they introduce new solutions. Um, so for us, extending the testing disciplines into DevOps practice um, outside of school disciplines and leveraging their, their capabilities just makes absolute sense. Cool. So DevOps has been launched um, very successfully um, and uh, we'd like to know more about some of the key segments of DevOps in the monitoring and review phase um, of, uh, of DevOps. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, I'm uh, Joel Deutscher, Global Practice Lead for Performance. Sounds good. Rock and roll. <laughs> Rock and roll. Uh, I'm one of the, the few strange people that have uh, been in testing my whole life. I uh, started an internship at a university uh, with uh, Compaq Australia in, on the Gold Coast, um, you know, testing a file system and uh, became hooked on testing ever since then. Uh, originally started performance testing and uh, looked at, we ended up building our own custom tool, the consultancy I was working at built-in pool, which was very cool. We'd walk in with servers into <laughs> huge organizations, drop them in and start running load tests from these crazy command line shell scripts. And that was a lot of fun. DIY. DIY was a lot of fun. And we came up with a lot of ideas and we ran, hey, this would be great, this would be great. Um, and then we found out a couple of years later that most of those things were probably in commercial tools, but um, we like to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, it was yeah. good. It's good to think of those things by yourself. Yeah. And uh, I've been with Planet for six years now. Uh, focusing on the performance team, growing the, the capability and really helping ensure that we have the, uh, the right people in place, uh, which is a very interesting thing to do when you're interviewing uh, technical people and especially uh, non-functional technical people mm -hmm. uh, and trying to find people that fit in a consultancy. It's, uh, it's a very interesting road. We hire maybe 2% of applicants, uh, which is uh, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we've got a great team and it's really nice to, to work with, uh, with like-minded people. So we kind of a few questions together to kind of uh, put some structure around, uh, around the conversation uh, but for, for, for the audience and, and including myself. Um, we just kick off with a uh, discussion as to who has done Trace, um, how does the products work, um, but more importantly, how does it contribute um, to a successful DevOps outcome? Mm -hmm. So if I want to get started, uh, so what is Dynatrace? Uh, Dynatrace is the company and Dynatrace is the product. We basically monitor the health of your applications uh, and give feedback, whether it is production feedback, if you have uh, production problems, whether that is impacting end users, uh, whether it's impacting infrastructure. Uh, we give feedback in load testing, so not only um, you know, your load testing to telling you you have an issue, but actually we tell you where the issue is because we sit within the application, we sit in the infrastructure to tell you that. And uh, I think the move towards DevOps uh, also, move. Let us move uh, all the way uh, back left or shift left uh, into the development space as well. So, Dynatrace is also heavily used uh, on developers' workstations as well as in your continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. Because what we really want to do is we want to deliver feedback as fast and as often as possible, every step along the way when you are checking in code and pushing it through the pipeline. And that's also Mark, what you've been promoting a lot, right? Um, with uh, giving giving feedback, uh, there's two approaches, actually three approaches that we take. One, an application-specific approach or an agent-based approach. You install an agent on your individual application tiers, which allows us to sit within the app and um, do typically on-the-fly bytecode instrumentation for Java and .NET, similar for Node.js and PHP. Uh, we also have agents for the mainframe, for message broker and other uh, middleware components. We also instrument the end user, meaning the browser, through JavaScript. We instrument the mobile device, uh, whether it's Android or iOS. And with that, we see what is going on when a user clicks on the button, which requests are filed off, where do they end up the web server, app server, through the whole chain, down to the method level, down to SQL statements, down to memory allocations, whatever you need. Okay, so this is the agent-based approach. It means you install something on the app. We also have a, a less approach which is database, uh, network centric. So we have a product called DCRAM, Data Center Reuse and Monitoring, which sniffs network traffic. And basically uh, through our, we call them protocol decodes, we understand the protocols that are sent over the wire and are therefore able to monitor performance of your exchange, your SAP, your Citrix, your Siebel. Um, so there's the uh, agent-less approach. And then the last one is synthetic monitoring. So there's a big need for synthetic monitoring to understand 
the reason why nobody is currently complaining or there's nobody on the on the website is because people cannot get to your site. So um, we do synthetic monitoring from different points in the world and can give you uh, performance and availability metrics, classical SA monitoring. Right. That's, that's quite comprehensive, to say the least. It is, yeah. And what we learned over the last couple of years, the more people that are using a monitoring solution like Dynatrace, the more applications that are monitored. By right now, uh, based on Gartner, only 5% of applications worldwide are monitored. And that's mm -hmm. going to change over the next couple of years and goes up to 20%. That means a lot of more data coming into the monitoring tools, a lot more people that need to look at the monitoring data. The problem is most people are not educated, they don't have, you know, they don't know what to look for. And that's why the big movement that we saw is we need to build some type of artificial intelligence on top of the data so that you don't need to educate a lot of new performance experts or user experience experts or network experts mm -hmm. on analyzing the data. But Dynatrace does it for you because we have a lot of know-how that we put up over the years. So we build artificial intelligence layer on top of our data and also a natural language interface where you can interact with the data either through Slack or either also through uh, Alexa, uh, Amazon's Echo, um, and I'm sure in the future also through Siri or whatever else you want to use. Yeah. Okay. When we talk about the DevOps, um, certainly Planet for us it's just three segments, people, process, and tools. You need, them all, you need all three in harmony uh, to have a successful dev DevOps outcome. Um, I'm really interested in the application layer, um, uh, the, the application stack itself. Mm -hmm. Developers can be resistant to change. Mm -hmm. What do they have to learn? What do they have to do? What hook do they have to put in their code to to enable Dynatrace to have effect monitoring and, uh, and tele telemetry um, for metrics to be collected? You have to rewrite all your code, right, Andy? That's, That's good. The That's entire good. app has to be completely rewritten. I'm sure yeah. the banks would really like that. Yeah, and it's also, it has a lot of overhead, so it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you also upload your code to Dontrace so you guys can have a look at it all? <laughs> actually, you upload it to the government, and they review the code. Right. Yeah. No, actually, it's a complete fallacy. Yeah. Because you can, you can actually, with the agent or the agentless, this is stuff that seamlessly works. Uh, we, at, at least in the work way we use it, we deploy the agent with all of the deployment software we do in the platform. So whether you're, you know, putting things on bare metal, you're deploying stuff within a Chef or Puppet or any of those deployment technologies, or you're in a container world, you can embed the Dynatrace agent into your dev environments, your test environments, uh, have them in the load test environment and dev environments, and of course production. You can see the whole pipeline. Um, without doing a, a lot of additional coding whatsoever. Hmm. Now, in some cases, you may want to do some, some special monitoring or special measures. It's very simple to tag that for a developer to just tag that in their code, right in the uh, in the assembly or in the uh, in the source code that they have as well. Hmm. Um, so it's pretty easy to, yeah, to set up. I would up. say for 99% for of the applications, it is copying an agent, which is on Windows, a library. I mean, on, on all the systems, it's a library. And basically, we are leveraging uh, open interfaces of all the runtimes, whether it's Java, .NET, PHP, Node.js, and we just took into these runtimes, which means we actually monitor the runtime behavior of apps without having you to yeah. modify and code. So that's a nice thing. Yeah. And in case we don't support a certain technology or a certain protocol to actually trace transactions across tiers, because this is one of the key features of Dynatrace, it, we call it the pure path technology. So it's the pure execution path of a single transaction from where it originates might be the browser, might be a pitch job, API, API right. all the way through across all the hops, and it's pure end-to-end -end tracing, so we call it pure path, and uh, we support, I would say, most of the common technologies, protocols, transportation mechanisms. In case we do not support something, we buy the development kit, so what you meant yeah, earlier, you can expand having, it. You can expand it. Yeah. And, Mark, so you're using this effectively in, in, within a CRCD in the CIC phase. Yeah, right? definitely. So and it, as we're, an independent. we're embedding tests, um, we're actually hooking into Dynatrace at that, at that level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there are a lot of customers that, if you think classic monitoring, it was resource level, CPU, disk, memory, network in production. And really, I think to Gardner's point, and talking about Gene Kim's research, that small 5% was really application level monitoring. And understanding that in the virtualized cloud world, you know, just looking at, hey, my CPU is higher. Well, which container, which VM, which process is actually causing that? Actually, takes me all the way back to like LPARs and mainframes. Like, I don't know who's running which JCL job, but whatever you did is just stupid, and we ended up doing that. So that sort of resource level monitoring was too expansive and not specific enough 
to get back to a developer soon enough to say, by the way, did you know your three lines of stupid code are, are the real needle in the stack in that old analogy? Um, and so it's really easy to start seeing uh, customers that had Dynatrace or had done sort of generic monitoring in production and trying to alert off that start stepping into an application code pipeline that moves very fast, a delivery pipeline that moves very fast. And you need to pull the guy who wrote the code, he or she, into uh, the operational fixing of that code and maybe rolling the change or a fix out within an hour uh, or right. minutes. Um, you have to be able to inspect and live within the code base across the pipeline at all times. Um, and I, we currently have different customers as well, my own teams, mm -hmm. that have Dynatrace in development, Dynatrace in QA, Dynatrace in load test, uh, and Dynatrace in production. So we can see that whole pipeline uh, and aggregate things together across the pipeline at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can yeah. see the variances between builds, depending on where, where those builds are taking place. Yeah. And have into QA, into prod SIT. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there was a long time ago, there was a product, I think it was called Hyperformix. You remember a Hyperformix in the main framework? I'm not that old. Don't All right. I'll, okay, I remember. Okay, dude. <laughs> that's fine. But it was, you know, the classic capacity planning was estimation and extrapolation or projections. So you had an estimated product that you'd do, you know, do a small run, do a medium run, do a large run, and plot a trend, and it was, it could take days to do that. Um, if you use um, the, the default instrumentation that you get by just having Dynatrace agents installed, and you bring that into its text, test execution uh, dashboards, it'll automatically sort of plot you that tolerance corridor. So the natural cadence of building uh, every day, potentially, or multiple times a day, you can see for the last n number of builds, hey, are you within tolerance? Right. Um, I think the way Andy described it is, you know, on, on, on a given Thursday, you've been, you know, six database calls, six database calls, six database calls, and someone checks something in, and boom, it's a thousand database calls. Right. I need to wait to production or large load test to throw a flag on play and say, right. hey, something looks seriously whack here. We, we don't know if it, maybe it's going to be okay, but at least it's different enough, and we catch it while the code is still fresh in the engineer's mind. Yep. That's how we use it, right? Good. We want to see that sort of what I call a, a corridor, a tolerance corridor, um, equally for things that go faster than they've ever gone before. Because yeah, also clues, 404s true. are really fast. Right. <laughs> read or, or not doing something is usually very efficient uh, processing. Sure. Um, so it's it, it's very interesting to, to have that tolerance sort of in po positive and minus ways, good. especially as the, as the building and release cycles accelerate. So as, as they must, yeah. As they must smaller batches, faster, mm -hmm. yeah, more bad yeah. feature, right? And through, yep. um, 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 just go ahead, ahead, please. Yeah, Mark mentioned uh, capacity planning, which is a, a great area, especially as we move to the cloud, where we have you know dynamic infrastructure, wickedly um, elastic, wickedly <laughs> elastic. And what we what we find is that uh, even though even though people are moving to this elastic environment, we're still over provisioning a, a lot of it, of the infrastructure in there because of just fear and general legacy, I think. We need, well, let's get five servers to start with when launch, and then we'll see, maybe we'll be able to reduce them. Yeah. How can you use something like Dynatrace help, uh, you know, right-size that environment so that we're not having all this, you know, large environment sitting there doing nothing? Yeah, well, I, I'll give a very short answer that maybe I think has some more insights. But I, one, I, I think when you are introducing new code and new resource consumption workloads, mm -hmm. If you can see it before it ends up out in the elastic world, mm -hmm. that gives you an indication that, hey, this is going to use twice as much CPU, even on my single VM, non-elastic dev environment or my medium-sized production-like environment uh, in low tests. You can get those indications early enough, and maybe even if they're off of, out of the core, if they're beyond a threshold, mm -hmm. you'll actually stop the release from going out where it would end up hitting real production code. Could you know, testing at scale is very common now because of the cloud. Yeah. Potentially, it could run lots of money. The only thing that's not elastic is usually the CFO's budget. <laughs> uh, so you can make all the technology in the world elastic, but but the money is not elastic when you think about it. Um, I'll mention I want, I want to mention Garanka from Facebook, who gives an interesting way of uh, managing. You know, sometimes it's really important to get a feature. Uh, out into production, even if it's going to consume more memory or consume more CPU cycles. Um, now, it may not be ideal, but business maybe wins. We need to get this feature out, even if it's a hog for CPU. Um, so think of, uh, I don't know, what they, in Australia, what's the, the other fix-it ticket? 
like the copy of a tail light out or a, it's a, it's the, a California. It's a, it's a California. What do you call it in Australia? Uh, it's an infringement notice. Infringement or, notice. Yeah. Come fix it ticket. It's yes. like wedding. It's a yeah. fix it ticket. Fix it tickets. Yeah. So you could say, you know, your release management comes and they start getting some early performance uh, numbers from your new release, and it's like, well, you're really out of tolerance. You've got some really crappy code. We understand you want to keep the feature out there, and people like the feature, so it's worth tuning it up. So they write sort of a, a time frame to say you've got six months. Mm -hmm. I want my hardware back right. because you you know this is worth investing in and doing. So that kind of sp spins on its head the old adage of you've got to make sure it's going to run in production. Once you get to production, old hardware stacks were not elastic, yeah. uh, and it was a very long lead time to to add more hardware. Um, that stuff all changing now. It's you have a lot more agility in terms of keeping capacity working optimally. Um, Andy, you have a story actually, I think, from Dynatrace when in, in production where you guys had some change that mm -hmm. did exactly that. Mm -hmm. So what happened to us was basically you know, deploying a feature. Actually, not deploying a feature, deploying a new update. And as you all know, code, if you write code, you have a little bit of your own code and the rest is all third-party frameworks and services, whatever you consume. We updated uh, a library that we use for distributed logging. The library uses dependency injection, mm -hmm. and that library that we upgraded to the latest version, unfortunately the latest version had a little different memory, memory behavior, so a memory leak. And basically we immediately saw memory jump up, memory jumps up, garbage collection kicks in, so CPU goes up, because we had to now run our SAS offering on, uh, in EC2 in a less environment, we just automatically added more hardware to the problem, yeah. right? virtual, really fast. Yeah, really fast. So no end user was impacted, but basically what we can now do with Dynatrace, and that's the key thing, with Dynatrace from a production environment, we can tell you source consumption per feature, per application, per user even, end user, uh, but really in the end it comes down to which feature, uh, and you can say, hey, um, while the system is handling itself right now, there's something strange that just came in. And therefore, you know, development team learn from that and, you know, let's get this fixed rather fast. Um, what I also want to say to your point, what you had earlier, mm -hmm. it's great that we see uh, continuously when we, when we push new builds for the pipeline that behavior changes. But the question is, if I go from one database statement to 10 or 100 database statements and it's a feature that is hardly ever used, maybe I don't care. Yeah. If it's a feature that is used by 80% of my people, mm -hmm. then I care. And it's also why DevOps is important and having the metrics from the same tool mm -hmm. from ops all the way into dev. Because now as a dev lead that handles the, the development team, we can say, you know, this code change is okay to go through even though it's bad, but it doesn't have a big impact. But this code change is not allowed to go through because it's going to impact 8% of our end users, which means so much more money that we have to spend. Mm -hmm. So I believe this is the critical thing on, on also what, what you, Mark, are doing with consolidating tools. Yeah. Right? Having the same tooling from dev in test across, the pipeline, across yeah. the pipeline gives you the same stability, the same data, people trust the data, and then you can make a lot of better predictions and actual decisions because in the end, what it's all about is making decisions on whether you're pushing a certain code change into the next life, into the next phase of the pipeline. Yeah. How do you deal with that with the customers? I was actually going to switch to security, but I'm going to stay, mm -hmm. I'm going to stay on the same question. Mm -hmm. So now we have development teams, they're small, uh, they're fast, they're typically using their own tools. We, we see that a lot. Sure. Mm -hmm. But they're productive and, they're, and you know, they can be supportive of operations that have additional overhead. That's a pretty good thing. So having one tool is probably, you know, it's the antithesis of how they live. How do, we, how, do, how do you work customers in, in demonstrating to all of these different, you know, my web development teams, my, my back-end legacy teams, my web teams? How do you deal with that and show them that, you know, one tool is so simple to, to embrace and that they can, you know, they can use the same logs, the same telemetry um, to identify root cause analysis? Well, uh, and it's, it's got to be some cultural resistance there. Yes, but I think at least... Mark, you're a customer here, so you can speak for hopefully back up what I'm saying. Yeah. I think the first time you show a team that is uh, consists of front-end, back-end developers, database admins, and whatever it is, and, and net network admins, once you show them that Dynatrace can really capture end-to-end -end transactions and showing everyone involved, the front-end developer, what his contribution is to the performance, the back-end developer, the database guy, they see, well, there's one tool out there that actually shows us directly who of us is responsible for what, 
and it comes out of one tool. We don't need to fight anymore. It's your tool. It's your tool. I don't trust your tool. It all comes from one consistent tool. And I think this is also the, the key to success of Dynatrace, having this, this technology. We call it the pure path. Right. So the end-to-end -end transaction flow across all these different technologies, so application technologies, also pulling data in, like what you said, logs, database metrics, network metrics, CPU metrics, memory metrics. We, we, we pull all this in into our data set. And then we often have um, you know, sessions with, it, with the teams that are doing like triage. And then we bring all the people in and say, I can exactly tell you which component contributes how much to the performance. And then people typically wake up and say, wow, this is actually interesting because now the finger pointing stops. And then people typically realize and say, I actually would like to have this tool as well in so, my environment. So now you answered one of the, the great DevOps questions. There's no blame game anymore. And exactly. you get to use collaboration across across the yeah. DevOps team. Yeah, so because, it, because, essentially, yeah, because essentially we are all sitting in the same boat, right? We, right? we are all working for a company and we want to make sure that the company stays in business by providing great software. So we should work together as a team. Yeah. Can't we all just get along? So um, that, to that comment, Steve, I mean, I think, I think that is that is the hard thing in, in sort of we're just going to stop doing the blame game. And then you're sitting across the same developer who's been screwing stuff up for six years. <laughs> they have the worst code. And some way, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm pointing to Joel. It's not you personally. You just, it's not you. Uh, but you know what I mean? You, sure, can't, you can't just sort of uh, rubber stamp when now we're agile, now we're DevOps, now we're no blame game. Um, to me, the approach that's worked is to find the thing, to, to avoid argument, um, and, and like tooling, like even if it's not Dynatrace, right, there's, uh, you know, stat monitoring that some, exactly. some guys like Nagios. So go to the database world, they're using the solar wind stuff or database stuff. Um, and it's like, I, I, I don't, the, the less time I've been arguing about which tool is right, and the more I can see the light bulb go off in, in my fellow engineer's mind, that's the real win, yep. whatever tool they're in. And eventually, it, you'll come around to saying, well, you know, every time I go drill something down, I have to jump into another tool. It takes me a few more minutes. I have to find the right link to then share with you so you can go into that same tool. And maybe casually during some meeting or maybe even escalation when, when the pressure's on, I'll show them the exact same thing, drill down into database uh, database methods, right? Database uh, dashlets of the Dynatrace uh, or method level hotspot if I'm working with a developer. Um, and the architects in the old days would be like, I know where all the hotspots are. I know where all the hot traffic is. And it's usually asynchronous. They learned it once, like two months ago on an escalation. And then that, you know, every minute that, that you put another release, that information has a half-life and a half-life and a half-life. Those are the guys doing code reviews right. in the old days. And that's a very slow moving process. And they went into their tools and studied their things. And here's a magic number that says you have to do X, Y, and Z with your sort of procedure performance. Right. And the truth be told, making it data driven and actually making data driven removes kind of the emotional barriers from those silos where I'm 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 gold to have my tools and the value is my ability to find this bottleneck in this database world. And so I'm cost optimized to make sure I can do that quickly, efficiently, at low cost, and in stay in that silo. In the DevOps world, the value stream moves across all of those areas. So now you're no longer incented as an engineer to have my own silo, my own tools have reduced cost in, in an isolated way. But I'm getting incentives to detect database things. Well, now the database guy gets, the network guy gets invited on early sprints. Yeah, Maybe there's, hey, we have a story that talks about something network intensive. Let's mob together and invent that together. Oh, okay. And using the same tools is suddenly like, I, I can't remember the last time I went into SolarWinds to look at some database thing. Well, I mean, it's, it's there. You know, maybe it's a sunk cost, but, you know, it, it does shift over time it does. as you break down uh, the functional dialogue. So let's, let's put, switch gears a little bit here. Uh, security um, is you know, near and dear to everyone's heart, mm -hmm. and, and it should be. How does Dynatrace um, help identify security threats, threats network monitoring, and, and I'm sure an awful lot more. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth spending some time here, how you 
and so forth. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. done. There's, there's different customers users in different ways. So on the one side, in production monitoring, you know, because we monitor every single user, every single request that comes in. Also understand the origin, like which IP addresses, which parameters are passed, so we can automatically detect certain patterns. So uh, it was yesterday I was in Canberra talking with some of the government people. They were, they were reporting like last week they had some universe, some server from Poland was hitting their, you know, probably some students playing around. Sure. But immediately Dynatry showed them, hey, we have a huge spike of traffic coming in on from that IP address range, and they're all hitting these five pages. It's unusual, so let's just block them. Mm -hmm. uh, other things is um, we because we see every single request that comes in with the parameters, we can identify things like SQL injection. Yeah. Right? We can see, oh, somebody's trying some strange parameter uh, yeah. patterns. Yeah. Uh, on the network side, the same thing, because we see all the network patterns, uh, network traffic, we can detect patterns and then basically alert in case something unusual is happening. Yeah. So this is one of the more the production side, and then I think you... Uh, we talked in the previous meeting about penetration testing, right? You can obviously do, um, when, when, when you do your testing, your penetration testing, the damage is, you can also be used to figure out what is the application doing when you are trying to do your penetration tests, when yeah. you are trying to do SQL injection, how far along does this parameter how actually go? How deep did it go? How deep did it go? Because right. we are capturing method level information, so you can, you can trace the parameter that comes in on HDB or SOAP or REST, whatever it is, and then you can see how far along does it go in the chain. Because we are, we give you method level details all the way down until the SQL statement, down until the next web service call that you make. So and that's that's where where that just comes in. Handy. I would say though, Andy, just to be safe, mm -hmm. I mean, Dynatrace doesn't position itself as a security tool, no, no, and that's understood a, for like political reasons. Yeah. I think that's probably good. So, but it can be used as a diagnosis tool. I know yeah. in our world, uh, the ISM team running the GRC for all of the escalations around info security, I mean, they have, there are specialized tools, specialized scanners, they will, but still that late in the game, do a pen test at the end of the project, that, that specialized team of black ops, whatever, <laughs> that model is, is not really cogent when you start looking at all of the ways we're going to embed security, static code analysis, even, like I said, uh, like you mentioned, qual uh, my quality test, my regression test. So I'm going to put some of my simple pen mm. testing things in an automated mm. regression test. Well, why would I? And that's exactly what they should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they should be. And um, you might not have the super guru pen testing guy on your QA team, mm. but they can learn from the pen test results and start with, yeah, there are some great tools that can help do that. Mm. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I guess that's a great point. I mean, you, you, you can't deploy 20 times a day following these old school models where you're Okay, we've built it, now let's pass over the performance testers. They say it's okay, now we pass it over. So yeah, that's a that's a, a great great thing. I think um you know, just just back to our point four uh, about the information, I think that's a really valuable part we've seen out of tools like Dynatrace and that that, that APM view. Um, and uh, you know, you mentioned before application performance monitoring probably isn't the right term for it anymore. Yeah. In fact, uh, we used to talk about it as saying APM was application performance management, yeah. but it yeah. kind of got uh, well, and then we talk about DPM, digital performance management, yeah, sure. because basically we expand <laughs> yes. in the digital world. Right. But then we have to change everything to be like a fruit or vegetable name. Yeah. It's the it's the like, like the, the cucumbers or the, cucum cucumbers, <laughs> rutabagas, lettuce, <laughs> pickle potatoes, like a testing tool. Though. Yeah, and then fish, of some kind. So tuna, whale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I think I think what we just if you go to our website, you know, we we say we. We figured out a way to redefine monitoring because monitoring is no longer just looking at an individual application. You're going to have environments where you have multiple applications in a virtual world, right? Mm -hmm. a, uh, on on a hypervisor, on a Docker container, or in, 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 on the Docker host in a Docker container, running you know somewhere in the cloud, on premise or in the public. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're competing. And you know, let's say that way, any allow developers to deploy whenever they like, different applications, different services. Mm -hmm. So monitoring one application is great, but I believe what we try to do is we want to help companies to monitor really their whole delivery chain that allows them to live, deliver services to the end users across all the different applications, services, whether it's front-end facing or, or back-end applications. And therefore, we, with what we did over the last couple of years, figure out a way how to monitor the infrastructure, the applications, the services, but because the there's so much, all the dependencies, mm -hmm. because there's so much data, we really realized we have to have some AI on top of it 
to make sense of all the data. Right. Because you may have one expert in the pro in the team or in, in the company that can deal with it, but the one expert might overload it. So you need yep. some some virtual assistant, and that will be that will be invested a lot. Yeah. Well, systems are complex. I mean, they're, yeah. they're complex. I mean, there's just a lot to yeah. deal with. And also we have new architectures, right? If, of course. When we talked about Microsoft architectures, services fail all the time for a good reason because you right. want them to fail. You kill them. Because you want to make sure that they're failing all to the next version. You know, if you do a, a roll sure. yeah. a rollout, and then you don't want to be alerted because the process dies. Mm -hmm. You want to be only alerted if the service that this, this microservice is part of mm -hmm. is actually having a negative impact to your end users. And, and monitoring redefined when we pulled it out of ops APM, the old yeah. APM and DPM, yeah. and it's actually monitoring the pipeline from. Cradle it's to grave, good. from the early parts of the app life cycle into test quality and all these other integration points. Mm -hmm. um, we're using the monitoring data in the application level to provide just enough data so that an engineer says, I have to make a decision on whether this is the right code, or I do it differently, mm -hmm. or will it pass, or is it secure, is it going to perform, do I have any vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. And we're not just using the monitoring to find out compliance and prod. I want to find it out like right now in dev. Right. I mean, dev plus QA, dev plus QA, and the feedback loop happening earlier. So your confidence level in by the time you reach production deployment is, is so much harsh. You've repeated the process so many times. Yeah, the risk that's comes down, the point. anxiety comes down. I mean, right. like for an engineer that's been like, oh, we didn't do like any testing, I don't have any data, I don't have any monitoring on. Holy crap, here comes Thursday and the big release at 5 a.m. Yeah. You know, everyone's, you know, drinking five things of coffee and they're just going nuts. And you know, that burns people out. Yeah. And we're seeing some of the best people in IT, you know, I'm just going to go surfing in Tasmania for the rest of my life. And, uh, <laughs> that's not appropriate. I'm in Australia. I should say Tasmania. I had a, I had a question that so came in. San Diego has great surfing. I had surfing a question that came in for one of my DevOps teams. San Diego is beautiful. Too. Yeah. Um, open source tools. Um, prevalent. They'll continue to grow. There's going to be new, new solutions coming up, you know, fast and we have mm -hmm. dinners here. Yeah. Um, how do you um, not only support new open source solutions in the new space? Um, but how does Dynatrace differentiate 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 itself if it needs to um, based upon the your so I, I think I, I think the, the the big advantage from us against I mean I think you can do a lot of stuff obviously with multiple source tools sure. right uh, if you have uh, an application environment and you have uh, Java .NET applications PHP PHP Node.js you can use four different open source solutions monitor all of them individually and then feed all the data into some dashboard solution that make you know make it work. I think what we invested a lot over the last couple of years actually having one solution that covers a big technology breadth, right? Mm -hmm. so we have a lot of technology coverage. Mm -hmm. We also have a lot of, uh, let's say, collective intelligence that we have in our engineers' brains and our customers' brains that we then automated. So we build value at top of the data. But then we also realize, you know, there's always going to be other tools out there. Elasticsearch, great product. So that's mm -hmm. why we said, well, why not just open ourselves up? So what we have, uh, we can stream data to external tools like Elastic because they are really great in certain things, right? We have extension points where you can make calls to our products in case we identify a problem. You can feed data into Dynatrace from other products mm -hmm. that support certain technologies they don't yet support, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are very open. Also, you know, we. Also, we ourselves we have open source uh, open sourced uh, some of our code, whether it's our actually artificial right. uh, Davis, our artificial intelligence layer, mm -hmm. uh, or let's say our 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 interface to, artifi uh, to our artificial intelligence layer. That's open sourced. We open sourced uh, the UO project, which I have here. Uh, the open source hardware project, visualizing quality steps. We open source uh, the recent. Uh, we built a tool for um, big memory dump analysis on Windows environments. Oh, right. We open sourced that as well. So we, we acknowledge open source and we just want to work with them. We understand that, uh, that we need to play with them, but we also, I think, know that we have a product that over the years has, you know, covered a lot of breadth in terms of technology support right. with a lot of knowledge in there. Yeah. Um, That's very good. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for, for individuals in, in DevOps. I put quotes around it as a cultural aspect of it that are you can buy a commercial product, and I think a lot of commercial products, having been a product manager uh, of a large performance product, uh, you pay the price if you don't open up and don't find a way to, mm. to, to collaborate, to contribute, and you know, isolation is sort of the death knell, I think, of a lot of commercial yeah. products at this point. Mm. So you can, you can never be there. Um, you can be everything to all people, so you, it, it's definitely a coexistence and, and peaceful coexistence. Uh, is part of the game. 
For me, I use open source tools in my development pipeline at different stages. I integrate stuff into Dynatrace. I have some teams that like to have stuff in their own little world. Mm -hmm. And as long as they're not slowing down the pipeline, mm -hmm. it works. But at some point, it'll be like, you know, I have to jump through three hoops to get over to your little thing that you wrote. And by the way, it's tech that, and by the way, you know, do you really, and suddenly it's like, ah, it's fine, we're done. You know, right. we have these ideas we want to grow. And it's like, if you want to leave the company and go start a startup, go, go do that. But so we use a mantra of uh, DevOps is it needs speed, but without sacrificing quality. Yeah. Um, so, and that's really what it's really about, getting yeah. quality product to market. Um, so monitoring tools have been around forever, right? I mean, back in the whole mainframe, this. Um, Dynatrace clearly has a different uh, uh, an approach to DevOps that contributes to solutions in the DevOps um, cycle. Um, if I was a customer, what should I consider doing before I move forward? What are the things I need to consider before I move forward with improving my automation, my metric capture, um, you know, my operation, for my applications and my operations? What are, give me three or four things that I should consider right up front before I say, Dynatrace, come and talk. What should I be prepared for? Well, I think... Um, Did that question surprise them, Jake? No, no, no. <laughs> it's <surprised. laughs> like three different answers. Like, yeah, yeah, there you go. I, so. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, for me, so the way I see it when people approach us, still a lot of people approach us because currently they are on fire because they deploy more often and then they're on fire in, in production. So they come to that trace because we are extremely good in doing root cause analysis for, for production problems, right? So they see, wow, we finally know what's going on. They can fix things faster, and then they realize the real value of Dynatrace, which is not only making them fast in, in, in fixing these problems in production, but actually preventing them up front. And that's when they say, wow, okay, so we, we put out all the fires, but now we make sure we're not opening up new fires by embedding it into load mm -hmm. testing, by embedding it into CICD, by starting actually uh, in development. We actually provide a free version of Dynatrace for developers mm -hmm. so that there's no excuse anymore that developers say it's too expensive for development managers. The Dynatrace personal license for every developer out there. And we built uh, automatic problem detection into the product. So I'm a developer, I can fire it up, and then Dynatrace tells me, here are your five problems in this particular transition. And so I think I think my, my experience has been before you not only step into a product like Dynatrace, is every tool, in my opinion, I have the need to learn something or have data to drive a decision. And so if I don't have a tool or even DIY open source you just mentioned yeah. or uh, integrated view, the sophistication of the question drives the sophistication of the solution. Uh, and that can happen at different points. So I tell a lot of customers, if you if you don't know the stream of decisions that you're going to make for every different product, and you could call it the value stream, I call it a promotional flow. Uh, if you don't understand that and sort of have it have an interdisciplinary team that is, wow, well, this is like a really important product, and we're going to make sure that it flows frequently and smoothly into production, plenty of feedback at the right point. Figuring out value stream for that flow, what data you need along that flow, uh, and how not to bottleneck the process. Uh, so what data do I need and where did that data come from? Figure out those things and figure out, you know, are we prematurely trying to get data that's not there? Are we really getting awesome. data too late and, and while we weren't able to make decisions? So I think figuring out that, that emotional flow or the value stream comes first. And then you'll naturally see, even like you say, from production triage to mean time to resolution kind of metrics, right. suddenly it's like, dude, if you could tell me that two weeks ago, it was one line of code. Yeah. Why didn't you tell me two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And so that's that, that, we took that all the way back to the corner office, I think, in our industry and said, yeah, we got to find this out like right. two weeks ago. Well, if you can, certainly you can map the, map the data you need, the information you need, and the fires should be there. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, yeah. the fire only yeah. you can prevent forest fires. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> well, another California term. I love it. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned um, kind of the, the alert level being, you know, being, being based at three in the morning, etc. Um, so, when we talk about um, information, the types of warnings that Dynatrace can can um, can detect. Um, I look at the SLAs, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm assuming that you have default SLAs or customers need know the SLA should be for. Uh, web, web, website response, mobile response, um, you know, all of those performance factors that you know, obviously just an expert in. Um, you mentioned Slack earlier, um, so I'll move out to chat ops, uh, for example. Um, 
and the question we had here, um, do you build in different escalation levels within Binatrace? So you have informational warning, uh, your error, you have fatal, so you can you can bring in different stakeholders um, associated with the with the warning levels with different escalation with processes. Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. Sure. it's sort of an MTTR, right? You know, when do I when do I actually go out to the community and say we're going to stop you for a while here, or, or do a Netflix? Yeah. So we're just going to keep it static for for, for a little bit. Yeah. So, so, as, as, so I think in general the way the alerting works in Binatrace. You have two options. You can either do static thresholds if you know you have hard coded SLS, right? And there again, you can define a warning threshold and a CV threshold, and then you can trigger different actions. But the other thing that is very interesting is dynamic baseline, right? You basically, you baseline what is your norm. Because if you have many, many services out there, uh, then you want to baseline them, and then in case something goes spin out of control, right? Yeah, and that's, so the baselining in production, we typically baseline on response time, failure rate and throughput. But in pre-prod, what you said earlier, in pre-prod when you when we analyze every single test that you execute on every single build, we baseline on key architectural metrics like number of database statements, number of log messages, number of how many how much memory do you allocate GCs, or yeah. GCs. And so we say whatever you whatever you changed just now, the code change is changing the dynamic behavior and I see this because of this metric because is totally out, it's because of the trend, yeah, because something is totally out of norm. Um, coming back to your question, so the alerting on the production environment, static or dynamic, and then you can fire off a Slack message, an email, whatever you Page want. Page duty. Page duty, yeah. yeah, they are just here with us in the city and we're doing a, a, an event with them tonight. Free so, t-shirts. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think more importantly what we saw and this is what we also built into this artificial intelligence layer that I wanted to talk about earlier. Um, I believe in very modern, highly scalable architectures, you probably don't necessarily have hard-coded SLAs anymore. You actually can't, you can't do it anymore. Yeah. So that's why we baseline. And then if we baseline and we find a service that is no longer responding with what it should be and actually is impacting your end users, for yeah. instance, on version rate drops, you know, people are starting, you know, going not do your service anymore, then we alert. And not only that, because we know the whole uh, dependency trees of all services that are run, all the applications, we can actually tell you what the root cause is. So alert, uh, alerting is one thing, but then giving people the right information for mm -hmm. them to fix it as fast as possible. To take action. Yeah. Exactly. So the mean yeah. time to spawn, the mean time to repair. Yeah. So under, uh, allow a little bit more of that operational resilience. Mm -hmm. around your environment and, and allowing for things like, uh, you know, that continuous disaster recovery exactly. approach where you, you're dropping machines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, okay, one of our machines went down, great. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to. That's, exactly. We've designed the system that exactly. way. We're not doing blue-green deployment, you mentioned, so exactly. allowing something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I want to ask is, uh, especially around, you know, application performance, we all know it's really important, and the holy grail, I think, of that is that the uh, the little light build light goes red because we've we've broken the, the performance exactly. of the application. Exactly. That's what you, what you yeah, can we can we learn a little bit more of how what it's how a, it's we, a we visual implement thing, that? but we're on a podcast, so yeah. you have to give you have some visual like picture. Yeah, we'll, we'll, picture we'll, we'll put some UFO. pictures online. Of, yeah, so we call, describe the UFO. Yeah, so we call this the pipeline state UFO. Initial idea came from our chief software architect who was frustrated that we constantly had broken builds and developers leaving the office and brought the left to build broken. So he said we need to do two things. We need to make the build times fast so that developers get feedback within a couple of minutes, the time it takes them from getting up from the desk and walking over to the coffee machine or to leave the office. And then we need to visualize the pipeline status with something visual that they see. So this is a UFO. It looks like a flying saucer. It has two rings. And the way we use it internally, the top ring visualizes the current state of the trunk. So if it's all green, it means the current build went all the way through, through all the unit tests, the functional tests, and everything is green. But if it breaks somewhere along the way, if it even can compile, then it's fully red. If it goes to the next phase, it's a little bit of red, but a little bit green. But the idea is, if I just checked in code and I try to walk home, and this thing is not fully green, I know something is wrong right now. Yeah. And the bottom ring, so internally, we do DevOps. We actually have, we actually call ourselves NoOps because we don't have a traditional ops team anymore for our SaaS-based solution. We give the developers a pipeline where they can push code through the pipeline, and we give them an orchestration engine that automatically deploys their code into production. And if they decide to deploy into production, we give them quality feedback for their feature. So the bottom ring basically tells them if there are currently any incidents on their feature. Incidents are detected by 
degradation in performance, increased failure rate, any outages. Or even customer calling in. Or customers, yeah. yeah. Like support tickets being created on their feature. Yeah. So that's the key thing. And this actually, as simple as the device looks like, it's very powerful because it, it radiates quality not only to one team, but also the other teams that are also, we're all in the same boat, yeah. right? And uh, shared, shared accountability yeah, as well. Exactly. So if somebody checks something in and they say, no, I'm just struggling with this, the, you can pair up and say, hey, let me, if you're having a bad day, let me jump in and help get you that done. Pull, Show you that thing like a Superman light across the, across a few city blocks at the same time? So yeah, we, yeah, well, the thing is you can install multiple of those. So what we have, we have a distributed, we have a distributed team working on in different sure. locations. Mm -hmm. And so not only do we visualize the status of our current team, the office here, so basically, but we can also visualize the status of the other teams that are sitting in a different geo. Yeah. Uh, also our marketing team use it now to visualize the, uh, the current status of the marketing campaign, whether they hit the conversion rate, yes or no, and things like that. Sales folks can use it for figuring out how, how much are we in the quota, are we fulfilling the yeah. this? Or uh, you can use it in your load test environment as yeah. well. So you, you're, I'm training, you know, build over build performance. So you could see here, Current current test and the previous test. Yeah. Is, is it going from green red or red to green or you know that kind of stuff? It, within uh, within an hour, you can see that. Right. And this is an open source project. Uh, so if you have a 3D printer and if you have the technical skills to put together, you can get it on GitHub. If you search for Dynatrace UFO, um, and it's a rest, basically once you hook it up, it connects to your Wi-Fi and then it opens up a REST API endpoint and then you can control all the colors. You make them turn around. You can make them really weird stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a final question from me. Uh, you, you mentioned before that Dynatrace has been on a on a journey to yeah. this uh, to, to move from traditional monitoring through to more of a DevOps model. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you see the next step going? What's what's the the future for for Dynatrace? And that's a very good question. So I think so we when we we not only do we try to figure out what is monitoring look like in these new cloud environments, but also what does it mean for a software vendor like us to the software in a different way. So we went through a transformation on the product side, but also on the process side. We actually use Dynatrace on that transformation. That's why we put a lot of features into Dynatrace to actually support the whole life cycle from dev in top. That's why we also believe we are one of the vendors that do not only want to sell your product because we think it's cool, but we actually know and put out in our own transformation. Where does it go? I believe we are not at the end of AI yet. So artificial intelligence, I believe, is, is still big. Uh, currently, we're working with a lot of the cloud vendors and the new technology vendors to make sure we are keeping up with the pace of technology enhancements that come out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, further than that, you know, there's, we'll see, I guess. But, uh, I think uh, when we were at Dynatrace Perform uh, from Pivotal Labs or Clown Foundry, their CTO or one of their futurists, uh, Josh McKenty, joined us on the podcast. And we actually caught him on, on his prediction about uh, Web 4.0. Uh, which is kind of laughable if you look at the, the, the semantic web and the things that were coming from Web 3.0. Mm -hmm. uh, but he actually threw a few things out there talking about his daughter, um, who's you know has no idea what CPU is or memory pipelines or processor architecture, storage, cloud, whatever. But she can write pieces of code that get run. So if you're looking at things like serverless apps running in Lambda yeah. or some of that stuff, there, I think the future may be that what we find as root cause analysis and infrastructure is only used by 5% of everyone that's writing code in the world. And the majority of people are like, they just live in an app layer the way I get in the car and I turn the key. I don't have to learn how a combustion engine or an electric generated engine works. There's that abstraction sure, right. layer from the hardware complexity that I, that I think may be the future. Mm -hmm. But that, that again is, there are apps we do have performance characteristics, there's user experience, mm. um, there's value in what people build, how they share it, how we interact. So I think that's that's a good move from Dynatrace, but a good move for the industry is to say, how do I make you happy without having to know JavaScript? Yeah. Because yeah. nobody I mean, should have to torture it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that the reason I didn't even bring serverless up because serverless is something we already do, so we already support Lambda. Yeah. We are, we have, uh, we actually announced that Form IoT support, so mm -hmm. we're working. Uh, we provide the agent for IoT cloud, devices. Yeah. 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 I think. Fantastic. Well, look, thanks very much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to learn about uh, uh, Dynatrace and their DevOps journey and how it uh, how it can really help our customers uh, find their journey. Uh, and I think the the key message here is information is is the power that we're looking for, and it mm -hmm. allows you to make clever decisions and 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 do things. Early, do them the right way so we're not waiting till the end to get things into uh, yeah. 
So before we find out. So yeah. thanks very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you want to really quickly just do uh, how do you follow Andy? How do you follow Mark kind of thing? Yeah. yeah how can people keep in touch kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, gents, how, how, can, uh, how can people follow the Don Trey story from here? And well, the easiest is uh, Twitter is at GrabnerAndy. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, we had a webinar, two webinars, one with our founder and CTO, Bernd Greifenia, on the transformation from top-level management down. And also one webinar that we can find a website on the bottom up with our DevOps manager. She implement actually this pipeline orchestration layer. Yeah. So go to the website and also go to at grab me Twitter and I have my podcast. It's called Pure Performance. You yep. can find us where uh, my colleague Brian Wilson and I talking about performance related topics. Yep. Uh, Fantastic. And Mark, how, how, how can people follow your journey? Well, the Perfites podcast is still alive and well. So uh, www.perfites.com, P-E-R-F-B-Y-T-E-S. Uh, and then I have a new podcast launching, which is Mark uh, underscore on underscore task. So that's the Twitter handle. But Mark on task, you can, you can go look at that. Uh, and then, um, yeah, well, just look for me out there on Twitter and follow the Facebook stuff that we're posting. It should be really fun. And thanks for having us. It's great. That's it. Thanks, guys.